Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. This is John McDougal. I am the event coordinator here at Murder by the Book in Houston. And we're super excited for tonight's event. But before I bring out our authors, I just wanted to make some general store announcement stuff as everybody's getting the notification that we have gone live. Uh, first up, the store is open. We just announced today that we are going back to requiring masks when you come in. So we please hope that you will uh, respect that and you know keep your fellow browsers and our staff uh, and yourself safe and mask up when you come in. Um, you might have seen if you get our email newsletter, we sent out a newsletter today. We had a handful of events that we had scheduled for September. We were super excited about trying to get some in-store stuff happening again this year. But with the rise of the Delta variant and the ICU bed situation here in Houston, we just don't feel comfortable trying to host in-store events. So all of the stuff that we had in-store has been uh, pivoted to virtual. I'm in the process now of updating the store's website. So if you um, if you check that out in the next day or two, you'll be able to get the, the details about those new events. Um, like I said, we really were hoping that we would be able to get a couple people in the store this fall, but uh, with with things going on the way they are, it's just not not safe. So, um, but we hope that you will come visit us. We are still doing curbside pickup if you prefer that. Uh, we've got so much great stuff in. Uh, we've got so many new books. We're always happy to recommend things on the phone and online as well. So we hope you will definitely come in and visit us. But we're super excited tonight to have Richard Chismar in conversation with Linwood Barclay. Um, our coworker, Sally, is a huge fan of Richard's new book, Chasing, uh, Chasing the Boogeyman. And um, as you guys know, if you've been in the store, Rebecca is a huge fan of Linwood Barclay. So we're super excited to have both of them with us this evening. We do have signed book plates to go with Richard's book. So if you order a copy of Chasing the Boogeyman from us, we will tuck one of those in there for you. And while they are chatting this evening, if you guys have questions for either of them, you can post those in the comments on Facebook or the live chat on YouTube, and I will see them and we will bring, um, I'll pop back in a little bit later and we will relay any of those questions. But I'm gonna get us started this evening. I'm gonna bring out Linwood Barclay to start. How are you tonight, Linwood? I'm just great, John. How are you doing? It's nice to be here with you. It's, it's good to see you too. Thank you so much for doing this with us. A pleasure. A pleasure. I'm sorry it's not in person because whenever I do a tour, you're always a favorite stop yeah. when uh, you come to Houston and, and come to Murder by the Book. So uh, I'm sorry we don't do that, but hey, this is this is better than not doing anything. You know? Exactly. And it's it's cool. This is, you know, being able to do these virtually and get up to speed with these has been able to, to get us to pair up people that we might not necessarily have been able to do because of, you know, time constraints, um, geography geography, stuff like that. So we're excited to be able to kind of pair up authors that we wouldn't necessarily get to see chat together. And I'll tell you, having done a lot of these in the last year and a half, I haven't lost, lost one piece of luggage during <laughs> these kinds of events. Yep. Yeah, there's always, you know, it's a lot easier to stress about, you know, it's two minutes before, oh, the person hasn't logged in yet, as opposed to the, we have a store full of people and there's no author here yet. So it's much yes. easier this way. Right. That's right. Or I missed my flight or it's been canceled. I actually almost had that happen. I think when I was coming out to see you guys or going to Poison Pen, I was leaving for Minneapolis and the airport was just complete chaos. And I can't believe that I made it. So yeah. anyway. So, so Linwood's most recent release was Find You First, which came out in May. And so for those of you who might not be familiar with him, Linwood Barclay is the author of 18 previous novels and two thrillers for children. A New York Times bestselling author, his books have been translated into more than two dozen languages. He wrote the screenplay adaptation for his novel, Never Saw It Coming, and his book, The Accident, has been made into a TV series in France. His novel, No Time for Goodbye, was a global bestseller. Born and raised in Connecticut, he now lives in Toronto with his wife. And now we're going to bring out Richard Chismar. How are you this evening, Richard? I'm good. How are you guys? We're good. Thanks for doing this with us. Oh, thanks for asking me. Uh, and as we mentioned, we have um, signed book lights to go with Richard's book, uh, Chasing the Boogeyman, which just came out on Tuesday. Um, and so Richard Chismar is the co-author with Stephen King of the New York Times bestselling novella, Gwendy's Button Box. Recent books include The Girl on the Porch, The Long Way Home, his fourth short story collection, and Widow's Point, a chilling tale about a haunted lighthouse written with his son, Billy Chismar, which was recently made into a feature film. His short fiction has appeared in dozens of publications, including Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine and the year's 25 uh, finest crime and mystery stories. He's won two World Fantasy Awards, four International Horror Guild Awards, and the HWA Board of Trustees Award. His work has been translated into more than 15 languages throughout the world, and he has appeared at numerous conferences as a writing instructor, guest speaker, panelist, and guest of honor. Um, as I said, if you guys have questions for, for Linwood or Richard while we are chatting this evening, uh, please post those in the comments and we will get to those in a little bit. But for now, I'm gonna turn it over to these gentlemen to chat and I will see you guys in just a little bit.
Great. Thanks. So, Richard, it's nice to see you and congrats. It's been the, the Chasing the Boogeyman came out yesterday. Yes. Yeah, and, and I mean, Ed, I should leave it to you to describe this, but I, I would call this a, a book of, this is uh, true crime fiction, I guess. What would we yeah. call it? How would you categorize this? I, that's that's as good of a of a phrase to uh, to describe it as I think I've heard. Yeah, it, it's a strange book for sure. Well, it is, and I had the, you know I had the pleasure of uh, of reading it early on, and it's really unlike anything else I've read because the approach was so different. Because first of all, it felt like a very you know, some parts of it felt like a very personal story about yourself, and you are yourself, you know, in this story. And a lot of what you're talking about is are things that are, are, are personal to you and have happened. And then you get into this, this you know, event and this series of, of this horrible stuff that's going on in, in where you live in this town. And because you sort of seamlessly kind of move in from what's presumably true to what probably really isn't, and it's, <laughs> it's a really interesting kind of a hybrid. And it's and so in that sense, it's a very different kind of a book. And and I and I think you kind of it was kind of a high wire act to, to do that. And I think you pulled it off. Thank you. Uh, you, you actually sounded like my agent the first time I, I sent it to her and, and gave her a brief description. And she kind of said, let me, let me see if I can get this right. And she pretty much said everything you just said. And I'm, I'm just sitting there nodding my head saying, and this is why I didn't tell you what I was writing. And I waited till I was finished and just sent it to you because I was afraid she was going to talk me out of it. Um, you know, then it's sort of, and I, and it's a kind of thing sometimes where, you know, if you're going to break all the rules, it's better to just break them first and not ask for permission. Because, you know, if if, if you if you told somebody in advance what you were planning, they'd say, yeah, that's not that's not going to work. So it's better just not let them know and just do it. And then they find out, yeah, it, it does. That's exactly what I did, and I uh, I let a few trusted. Uh, friends in on the secret. Bev Vincent was someone I told fairly early on and asked Bev, I, you know, am I crazy for doing this? And and God bless him. I'm, I've been doing that to Bev for a decade or so. So it, his response is always, no, this is great. You know, um, he's honest about the writing and he's a great reader for me. But uh, when it comes to the ideas, he, he'll, he'll never talk me out of anything. So, yeah, it's interesting. You know, when I when I came up with the idea for Chasing the Boogeyman, I, I wanted to Blair Witch the project. I wanted to just, my initial manuscript uh, had the subtitle of a, a true story of small town horror. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to portray this story as, as, you know, uh, as a true crime story from start to finish. And, and that's, that's one of the reasons I have photographs at the end of each chapter. I, I wanted to add a level of authenticity. Um, I wanted to have a, a, a 1990s era website uh, designed and thrown on the internet. Um, so when people looked up, you know, the, the events and the victims, they, they had something to find and, and, and plant some fake newspaper articles. And, and I also wanted to do like a short documentary that they could stumble upon online. Um, but once we sold it to Simon & Schuster and the lawyers got a hold of it, they, they nixed that very, very quickly. <laughs> well, how, I mean, it's only, I know it's only been out a couple of days, but are there, have you heard from, or are you getting the sense that there are some readers who haven't quite figured it out yet that they're, like, um, is it true or is it fiction? Like they're not quite. I mean, the, the you mentioned the photographs. And you should tell people. We should tell people that you have some of these sort of grainy, very authentic-looking sort of crime scene photos that appear through the book. None of which are the real thing, right? right? So, right. It looks so authentic that are, do you have? Are you getting any sense from some readers that they're they're not quite sure? Um, in several of the reviews, readers have mentioned that they've stopped reading to Google, to Google's people's names, um, dates, incidents, that kind of thing. Even though it says right on the front of the book and on the arc, it says a novel. Um, you know, Simon yeah. Schuster's idea to, to make sure that we weren't all sued was to put a novel on the front cover to have a disclaimer page in the front. Yeah. How would you get well, I mean, if, you, if it's all made up anyway, who would be getting libeled? If you, I don't know. I, what's interesting is my, my oldest son, Billy, who, who's a very creative guy and usually a fly by the hip, you know, kind of guy. When he initially read it, he he was so worried. It was kind of cute. You know, he you don't usually see this level of concern from a 22 year old. But he uh, he was so concerned that that dad, you can't do this. The property values in Edgewood, are, you're going to drive them down. <laughs> you're going to scare people. 
you're going to, you know, the whole thing. And, uh, and he ended up being right. He's, uh, he loves to, to look at me now and say, I told you so. So I don't know, but they, you know, I use a lot of real names, uh, lots of real locations. Um, so there a lot of permission forms were needed to be signed by friends. Okay. And, I, and you know what you should, I should step back and you should just, for those who are not yet initiated, just tell us what it is about. Um, it, it, it the, you know what, I should be better at this by now because I've done a lot of interviews for this, um, but it's such an odd book. It's, it, here's the thing, back in 1988, I was a fresh faced 22 year old graduate of the University of Maryland. And I was working on the first issue of a magazine called Cemetery Dance, which would eventually become, you know, my, my life, my career. Um, but at that time it was just, you know, I tell everyone I was young and dumb enough to think I could publish a magazine. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of speed bumps, but I was 22. I just graduated college of journalism, um, never bothered to put together a resume, just uh, decided to move back home for nine months. I was engaged to my, to my wife now, who's my wife now. And um, we had nine months until she, you know, finished PT school. And, and you know, it, I decided, hey, let's save some money instead of, uh, you know, me moving into an apartment and waiting for her. So I moved back home. It was a very interesting time and, and, a, and a strange dynamic because here I was kind of on the cusp of real adulthood and I was living in the bedroom and the house that I grew up in, um, you know, looking out the window on the side yard where I played wiffle ball and marbles and climbed the weeping willow tree. So it was just a very it was a very ripe time for emotions for the for me. And at the time, there were these incidents going on in this small working class town that I lived where uh, an unknown assailant was breaking into to houses at night, usually through unlocked doors or windows. And he was caressing the hair or like the arms or the legs of sleeping women. And then when they woke up and, you know, startled, he would take off into the night and he, he wasn't caught until many, many years later for something else. Um, but looking back and my memory is usually pretty sharp. I thought this only happened five or six times. But once I had the idea for this book, I did some research and, and I was shocked to discover that it had actually happened over 30 times. And the guy was never caught until the mid 90s in Baltimore City for a completely unrelated crime. And he admitted to the, to this series. So anyway, long story short, I'm trying to make it short. Um, you have this 22 year old writer who's selling crime, mystery, suspense, horror stories. He's editing this magazine called Cemetery Dance. He's the ultimate horror fan. And this is going on in his town. Um, and it felt like I was kind of in a movie because people were buying, uh, people were locking their doors and locking their windows. People were buying floodlights, yeah. uh, alarms, and some people were buying guns. And it felt like, you know, it felt like a, a very early, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a very early version of Scream, the movie, you know, where that small town was just kind of held captive. So, my mind immediately went to what if he was doing worse than he's doing? What if he was killing people? And that's kind of where Chasing the Boogeyman came from. And, and I decided I was going to, in a bizarre move, I decided I was going to make myself the main character. I was going to write about my time there as, uh, as honestly as I could. And I was going to involve myself in this series of murders. And it, it became a, a story about my loss of innocence as well as the town's loss of innocence. And you also get into a lot of stuff in your own history, like some, some difficult times, health, health things that you went through and so forth. I mean, you put kind of threw everything into it. I did. I, I, and that's one of the reasons I decided, you know what, Rich, it, it's just got to be you. Um, you know, you take a guy who, who I don't go to many conventions. I don't get out, you know, and, and many people are watching this probably just laughing going, you know, that's an understatement. You uh, recluse. <laughs> you know, um, I don't get out much. Uh, so again, that was like, that was an interesting point too. When I, I told my agent about it, I said, Oh, and by the way, the, you know, the main, the main guy is me. She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, yeah, he's Rich Chismar. He's me at 22. Um, because it was such a, it became such a personal story that I knew, uh, you know, you might as well not hide behind a, you know, a, a nameless or, 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 you know, a different narrator. Is that, is that from the point of view of writing it, does that make it actually, easier or more difficult i'd like i'm just thinking if it were me if i'm going to put my uh, put myself into a sort of fictional situation but i think there would be aspects of that that would really kind of help in the narrative because i know who i am i've got that i could just be myself in the story and it's that that would allow it to to 
I don't know, kind of progress more easily. Is that, did that, was that true? Yeah, it, it was true. And, and the thing is, is I've had many people say, oh, that had to be tough, Rich. That had to be more difficult for you. Um, and I, I want to just nod and say, yeah, this was a tough book. And instead, I have to be honest. And I'm like, this one came really easily and really quickly. And it was just a joy to write. And, and I feel bad saying that because it wasn't a joy writing about the murders, of course. But the rest of it, the framework um, and, the, and the personal story that kind of was, was woven in between everything, um, it, you know, most of that was real. Um, yeah. So, and I've said this many times, but it's just so true. It's, it's you know, I lost my parents. Both of my parents were gone by uh, 2007. So writing this book, they were here. And I was having dinner with them and, and I was having talks with my dad out in the garage and I was teasing my mom, you know, about dinner being late or, or you know, her not being able to drive or whatever. So it, 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 that was a joy. And the same thing with writing about my childhood friends in, in that, um, you know, beginning section where I kind of kind of set the table for the town. You know, um, some of my friends are gone. I'm, I'm very close with with most of my childhood friends still. Um, but, you know, they're scattered all over the place. So. So you fairly, were you fairly young then when you lost your parents? Um, you know what? I was. I lost my mom in two thousand and one, and my dad in two thousand and seven. So okay. I was. Yeah, I mean, I was young, but uh, you know, yeah, I was in my thirties. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I've even I even dreamt of my parents more while I was writing this book. So in that, I, I've actually said I've been like at times it felt like a self, if kind of self indulgent because I was having a blast. I was writing about these childhood memories and just giggling at the keyboard, and 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 thinking I better ask him if that's okay. I put this in here. Um, so yeah, it was it was just uh, it was it was so different that it was just fun. You know, I I wrote um uh, before I started doing novels. I did a memoir that came out in Canada. It came out in 2000 called Last Resort. And and so that was that was writing my own sort of coming of age story, but it was all legit. Like it was right. all written. But what I found was interesting was that um, I didn't really plan it out before I started. And, I, and if I had set out at the beginning to make notes of all the things I wanted to write about, I don't think I would have remembered them. But as I started to write it, one memory led to another, which led to another, which led to another. And it was kind of like, you know, dominoes. Like as soon as I sort of wrote one thing, it sparked a memory of another. Right. And, and it just kind of, and it was, and it all just kind of flowed and went very, very smoothly. Yeah, no, I, I was the same way. And I actually had to cut, you know, some of the things that, that, that uh, surfaced in my brain, even though, I, you know, they're great stories. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of them would have made people smile or laugh, but I'm like, yeah, no, enough's enough. And, you know, I actually fought a little bit to keep, you know, the length up front, um, some of the personal recollection stuff in there, because I just felt like by the time they get to the uh, by the time we get to chapter three and we get to the the nitty gritty of the crimes and, and what's going on, I wanted to make sure that they that they had a really clear picture of the town and a really clear picture of me. And that's something I that. You know, I kind of model that after a lot of true crime books where in the beginning, you know, they often set up the place and then they kind of set up the major players and then they get into, you know, what happened. Um, so, yeah, I, I kind of, you know, I'm a big true crime fan and I've always said I'm like, oh, I would love to write one of those just, you know, what I feel like are really, um, you know, significant pieces of writing about such a, you know, somber but serious subject. Um, so I kind of just, you know cheated and didn't do any of the research. I just made it up, you know? Um, well, I think the first true crime book I ever read was Helter Skelter. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't read a ton of them, but it was that and then The Stranger Beside Me, the two that, that immediately come to mind. That book gave me nightmares. The, the first time I read The, the Stranger Beside Me, um, yeah, I had nightmares. Uh, that several different, uh, you know, incidents in that book, including when he bludgeoned those, those college you know, sorority girls with the, with the piece of firewood that he picked up from outside. I remember about, about six, seven years ago, I was at a dinner, publishing dinner thing in New York, and I was sitting across from, from, from a woman, and, and I didn't, you know, we hadn't all been introduced. And, and this woman across from me said, oh, hi, I'm Ann Rule. And he went, no. <laughs> right. No. Mm -hmm. She said, oh, yeah. And she, so we talked about that book. She said, yeah, she said, you know, I used to leave my my daughter with with kids with him to look, right. to look after him, with Ted Bundy. And and when I said that to him one time, I said, you know, I left my kids with you. And he said, as if this was a really 
sort of magnanimous gesture, he said, oh, yeah, I would never have hurt your kids. Oh, yeah, I can't. That, that you know, that chills me right there. So, yeah, no, you know, like, like, I'm, you know, I, I'm not that bad a guy. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's we were friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I, I've read that thing several times and it, it uh, I, I, that's been my answer several times when people said the scariest book you've ever read. Um, you know, many other times it's something else, but that that comes back time and time again. So seeing as how this is a book written by you, about you in a fictional way, if they ever get to make in the movie, of course, you, you're you might be too old to play the Richard Chismer in the book. But you can get one of your sons to do it. Well, we were going to do that in the documentary. Everyone talks about how my 22 year old Billy is uh, the spitting image of what I look like at that yeah. age. And for the documentary, we were uh, toying with the idea of doing that. And we may do it again. Who knows if, if yeah. the country goes in lockdown again and, and you know, we're kind of uh, confined for a time, you know, a long period of time. We may uh, do that just so we don't go stir crazy. So it could still happen. But well, let's set, let it happen without a lockdown. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm just I'm kind of. I'm kind of seeing the writing on the wall and hoping it doesn't happen, but thinking it it very likely will. I know. How was the you know the question that a lot of us as writers get is how how the lockdown affect you or how did it affect your work? Um, you know it, what's interesting is is friends and family loved to make me the butt of the joke and say you know this lockdown hasn't affect Rich at all because he didn't go anywhere before this you know and he ate fast food all the time and not fast food but uh, delivery you know. Yeah. Um, my favorite breakfast place, which I used to go to every morning because um, they never did deliver. They delivered during the uh, pandemic and, and they more or less said, you kept us in business during that time because every morning they, they were here. And um, But it didn't. Yeah, it didn't. Uh, you know, other than I was glued to the television set, at, you know, watching news, um, you know, obviously I was sad on a daily basis and I knew many people personally who were affected. But as far as the my writing, you know, I wrote two books, including Chasing the Boogeyman during that time period. And, uh, you know, yeah. I just had time to, I didn't have to make excuses to stay home and work. And you mentioned something in passing quickly that I didn't know. Did you say that you had a, you took journalism in college? I did. I, I went from being a business major to being an English major to eventually uh, transferring to University of Maryland for their journalism program. And that it was when I was at Maryland that I, I was writing, uh, some freelance stuff for newspapers and that's when i started the magazine i just thought you yeah, know i can do this and and uh yeah did you ever actually work in at a newspaper or work in that field or no my extent was writing for the college newspaper um then my my county newspaper which I, I talk about a lot in uh in chasing the boogeyman the hartford county aegis i i had you know several articles published there and then i had one article published in the sun paper i i, I wrote a piece about earl weaver the uh, baltimore orioles manager um I did an interview profile thing with him and, and and it was printed there. But that was the extent. But, you know, that was the thing. I, you know, God bless them. My very uh, conservative, uh, old fashioned parents thought I was going to put together all my newspaper clips and write up this this glowing resume and go out and become a, uh, a journalist. And instead, I never even wrote the resume. And I worked on my little horror magazine and, and made no money at all for many, many years. Um, but uh yeah, I was I was lucky to have their support. Yeah, because I spent I didn't actually take journalism at university, but I spent thirty years in newspapers, thirty one. But um, and I think because you have talked about through the pandemic watching the news, and of course, all through the pandemic, I had CNN or the, the Canadian equivalent or what, and and you know a lot of people would say, just turn it off, you know, like it's just because you know, it was just driving me crazy, and I you know I found that I was gritting my teeth so much I was wearing them down through all these last at least four years anyway and and um, but I find that if journalism is in any way kind of way in your background it's very hard to turn off and disconnect right it is and it, it, it that that uh, you know even though I didn't even have you know you had 30 years you were you were like one of the guys I idolized um, but when you're a journalist and you kind of have that 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 blood going through you, you, you know, you know this better than I do. You're just always uh, attracted to the story. You know, your, your ears are always perking up and, and yeah, I watched CNN so much that uh, again, Billy, my son, he would, uh, he would ask me to turn it off. He'd say, dad's just stressing me out. Can, can you change the channel while I'm in the room and you can change it back when I leave? And I'm like, absolutely. I'm like, 
I never watched, you know, cable news before, uh, you know, before that era. So yeah, it, it, I'm with you. Yeah. It's kind of an addiction in many ways. You know, it's, it's, I, you know, I was, I, I tweeted this week. I was, you know, I felt like in all my 30 years, three decades in, in, in newspapers, I never was can remember a period where there was just so much awful stuff oh. happening at once. You know, whatever it is, pandemic, fires, you know, warming, the rising oceans, you know, pandemic, I mean, just everything. Afghanistan, like it was just, you know, it's just, and, and I just think if I could find somewhere to go and just not know this, I'm almost to that point. Yeah. And what for me made it so just bizarre, it made me it almost made me feel like I woke up every morning thinking, you know, am I still asleep? Is that all those things you just mentioned? And yet there were people arguing about whether they were bad things in the first place or not. Um, <laughs> you know, there were, oh, well, those forest fires are their fault because of this. And you're like, no, that's not logical. Number one. And number two, it make you know, how can you really believe that? But there they were, you know, and oftentimes my friends, you know, on social media, you know, that I've known for a long time agreeing with these, you know, people. And I, so yeah, every, every day was a struggle. If they'd only vacuumed these forest floors, they wouldn't have these problems. Exactly. You know, but, uh, you know, and, uh, but so what's, um, I mean, I know that this is just, the book is just out and you've got, there's another Wendy's, uh, Wendy's, uh, book coming correct next year or, or there is in february um in february we'll publish cemetery dance will publish the hardcover and then gallery um will come i think three or four months later and do a trade paperback just like they did for the this first is a, this is a bigger more ambitious wendy's book isn't it than the others it is it is this uh the third book was steve's idea um yeah. And he kind of, you know, it was a Sunday evening and my phone started beeping several times and it was, he was texting me, well, what do you think about this with Gwendy? And what do you think about that? And as, as the text, as more texts came in and the length um, increased of each text, I, 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 you know, I started thinking, oh, this, this is, he, this is for real. This isn't just, uh, you know, a Sunday, a Sunday evening. Have you ever seen this movie kind of text exchange? Um, right. So by the end, yeah, you know, I, he, I could tell he was excited. I was excited and, and I, you know. I just flat out say, we're going to write this one together. And he's like, yeah, let's block out some time. So this one's longer. This one involves um, several storylines, you know, from from the Stephen King universe. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it was a blast to, to do. Oh, well, that's great. Well, I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. What are you still doing? And I mean, I think that some of your best really great stuff has been your short story collection. They sort of, you know, and and they're, they're, what do they remind me of? It's reminding me of I don't know, like twi little Twilight Zone stories, or kind of Ray Bradbury stories I've read when I was in my teens. Who were you? Who were some of the writers you were reading when you were like in your teens and growing up? Um, you know what you just mentioned. Uh, people say, always say, "How did you start?" And I'm like, "Well, you know, the earliest I can remember are like some of those Twilight Zone comic books yeah. um, that were on the shelf." And, uh, you know, and I wasn't a big comic book reader as far as I, you know, I wasn't into superheroes and all that, but, but the scary stuff and the weird stuff I, I was attracted to. And then the big thing was the Saturday afternoon creature double features. Um, you know, I was an outside kid. I was always running around swimming, playing wiffle ball, playing football, climbing trees, you know, doing all that in, in the neighborhood. There was a big pack of us, but I used to piss off my friends because come Saturday afternoon, I'm like, I got to go. I'll be back in four hours. And I was in front of the TV laying on the floor with my hand, you know, like this. And that it, that was pretty uh, religiously every Saturday. And and then and, and I was one of five children, uh, always books around. My, both of my parents read um, three sisters. So I, I read like Sidney Sheldon books and stuff like that when I should not have been. Uh, okay. I learned a lot. Um, but uh, yeah, somewhere in there, Salem's Lot crept in. And yeah. it kind of just went from there. And uh, and I was always th that kid who was scaring his friends, too. I was always, you know, I talk about it in Chasing the Boogeyman. I was the one at night when we were walking home from somewhere who would say, well, hey, guys, what if this happened? And I'd tell a story. And then at some point, I'd look over my shoulder and pretend I saw something and just scream and take off running. And then they would all, you know, they would all, including my best friend, who was who was so much, who, who was a wonderful guy, still talk to him all the time, not very athletic. Um but somehow on those nights would always fly past me and, and be the first one to safety. Um, but yeah, that, so that's, uh, that's kind of where I found, you know, my initial love for this stuff. Like you said, Twilight Zone and then Ray Bradbury in school and Stephen King. Yeah. 
Yeah. For me, I was, I mean, I read a lot of that stuff. Well, of course, I'm older than you are. So I wasn't reading Stephen King when I was growing up because he wasn't operating yet. My introduction to, uh, to Mr. King was 1976 when my wife to be and I went to the theater in Toronto to see Carrie. Oh, neat. And, and if there's a scarier last 30 seconds of any movie oh. than Carrie, I don't know what it would be. Yeah, I'm with you. And, and uh, so that was, in, and of course, that introduced me to the novel it was based on and so forth. So, but through my, I was more, for me, my was more into uh, crime fiction mm. and uh, mystery reader, mystery writers and all that kind of stuff for the most part through my teens. Right. Well, that's my father read. Uh, he he was his main thing. He loved to read spy fiction, espionage, that kind of thing, which I wasn't interested in. But he also read a lot of crime. So I did get my hands on some of the gold medals and that kind of thing. Um, and then when I was just, you know, when I was 21 and I started selling some short stories, some really bad short stories. Um, within a couple of years, I stumbled across uh, Ed Gorman. Um, yeah who used to edit mystery scene. And it's just, you know, for me, he was always the writer's writer because he wrote everything, crime, mystery, suspense, horror, Westerns, you know, all of it. And and, and it was reading Ed's crime fiction that kind of really set me on the path to 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 write better short fiction in the, in the collections that you're talking about. It, you know, I used to, um, and this is something I always tell writers, you know, I used to kind of, every time out, I would try to you know, kind of reinvent the wheel and write this intricately plotted, you know, masterwork of, of suspense. And it never was, it was a mess. Um, and it was just never honest storytelling. And I always felt like I had to say too much. And then I, I, I discovered uh, Gorman and Joe Lansdale and, and some of their stories were so, um, you know, simple plot wise, you know, and they were anything but simple as far as the craft of writing and, and, and construction. But, you know, Ed could write a story about, uh, you know, an elderly, um, you know, hitman sitting on a bench at a, at a bus stop and and a young woman with her child sit next to him. And the whole story could be their three page conversation, but it would just leave you, you know, breathless. And it was it was because it was so honest. And, and that's the point I was trying to, to make is that I learned that through Ed, especially and also Lansdale and some others. Um, that as long as you were telling a story that mattered to you, you know, about a person or a place or this moment in time and that you could tell it honestly, you didn't have to reinvent the wheel. And and I'm really lucky that I stumbled upon that lesson because I'm still not much of a plotter. You know, it's just more about, you know, I kind of tell campfire stories, you know, and and try to draw you in that way. So, yeah, I'm, I'm always uh, somebody asked me last week if you could have dinner with any writer you know, living or, or dead, who would you pick? And I picked Ed because I knew the guy for two decades. He was a huge supporter of my work, um, but I never met him. So it would have been interesting. You know, he, uh, Ed was always a sweetheart, but he had that crusty side. So I, I, a dinner would have been very entertaining and probably about four hours long. That's for, I, mean, I think that, I think it touched on something there, which is that writers who set out to try to impress us often don't. And those who tell who, you know, they're, writing simply is not anywhere near as easy as it looks. Right. And, you know, some, I, a couple of times I've been asked, what's your favorite sentence that anybody's ever written? And my favorite sentence is from uh, Elmore Leonard's novel, Writing the Rap. And it's Raylan Gibbons, you know, and he's, he's, he's transporting some guy that he's, you know, on, he's found, you know, as a marshal, he's taken him back. And there's this immensely long paragraph where this guy that he's arrested is just talking and he's just shooting this shit and he's going on and on and on and on and on and on. And then that paragraph ends and there's a three word paragraph and it says, Raylan got ready. <laughs> I love it. And what those three words tell you is that Raylan knows that everything that he's this guy said is just bullshit and he's getting ready to do something and Raylan's getting ready to deal with it. Right. And it's all there in those three words. And I think it's genius. Yeah. It's yeah. just genius. Yeah, no, I I agree. I love I love yeah, well El Elmer Leonard, yeah, you know, and all his dialogue and everything else. But uh 
Yeah, I agree. It's it's not it's not easy to people say that sometimes. Well, his his writing, you know, you don't even have to stop and look up a word, you know, in the dictionary. I'm like right on, you know, yeah. you, you know, uh, anything to keep you in the story. And and you you know, the good writers, you forget, you, you know, that you're reading and you're there. And 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 you know, for like for me, I mean, I, having spent, as I say, three decades in in newspapers, in newspapers, you you know, your objective is clarity and to get to the point. And right. To, Try to impress everybody that you know all these really big words or whatever or all this floor description your job is to communicate and tell your story as succinctly as possible and and that's why you know you look at somebody like michael connelly whose background is journalism that's how he writes right and 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 i that's the kind of writing that i that i particularly like you know i just you know it's like leonard said you know he doesn't write the parts that people skip anyway right that's great yeah, no, I'm with you. When I used to read the slush pile by myself for cemetery dance, and I was reading 500 submissions a month, mm -hmm. and people would say, "Well, how do you? How can you possibly do it?" And you know, do you feel obligated to read the entire manuscript? And I would say, "Absolutely not. Not with 500 a month." Um, and they're like, well, "Well, what is the most important thing with that that opening?" You know, for me, I always said it's clarity because if I have to read your opening paragraph twice, you know, I'm most likely going to put it down and not read the second one. And you know, and I think it's also. And, and this is something I've kind of learned from working with my agent, but it's, you only really have to read one page of something to know, I think. And that's, it's, you're looking for like the clarity, but you're looking for voice. Right. You're looking for voice and, you know, plot or most problems can be fixed, but you're looking to see, is there something in the way this person writes that's distinctive or that there's a voice there? And you don't have to read 80 pages to find that out. The heard, I don't wish I could remember who it was who said this, but if somebody serves you a dinner, and it really doesn't taste that first bite tastes awful. Right. You don't have to eat everything else on the plate to be sure. Right. Although my wife will say, <laughs> she always pulls this out. She's like, according to this study, you have to try something 14 times before you really decide whether you like it or not. I'm like that yeah, no, study was no. written by someone who is who, you know, is full of you know, you know what? I'm like, because let me tell you something, you'll be lucky if you get me to try it twice. And she's like, Yeah, but you're a big kid. And I'm like, Yeah, no, that's not, that's no, not. I'm with you, man. It's it's what you said for me. It, I always said it was voice and it it was kind of finding that rhythm in the language. Um and, and I don't know whether it was Lansdale or it might have been Koontz or somebody. They, they said, you know, bad writing is just like a bunch of dead beetles lined up on the sidewalk next to each other instead of words. And 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 when you instead you, you line them up so they form some kind of rhythm in the telling, then it's a completely different thing. And, and that's what I've always said is, you know what? Yeah, you can read a page and you can tell whether that person has that or not. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I you know. I was young and energetic, so I read a lot of complete manuscripts, but uh, I also stopped after, you know, page one on an awful lot of them. You know, I, I remember years ago being asked to read for a short story contest that our newspaper was running. Mm -hmm. And I was another, and I was a couple of different contests that I had judged. I know there was one where I had, I had six novels that were finalists and I had to pick one in some sort of category. Wow. And there were a couple of, the, you know, at least one or two of the novels. The thing that was really helpful was if you read the first novel and it was pretty good, and then you went to read novel number two and you thought, well, this isn't as good as that one. So I don't even have to bother with this one. Right. You know, just sort of go. And, and, but you could usually tell pretty quickly is this one got a chance or not? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. You know, but, uh, but it's an interesting way for us, you know, to make a living. I always think it's, you know, it beats working in a bank. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, a, a, a bad day, you know, yeah, the old cliches, I was going to say a bad day of fishing is, you know, but yeah, that's that's how I, and, and especially with, again, you know, some projects that it, it, it's painful for me and I don't, I don't know if you're the same way or not, but I tend to write very quickly. Um, so on that first pass, you know, I, I'm never sure what is going down on the paper. And, and in rare instances, I, I actually know, you know, hey, this is going to work. But uh, it's when I go back, it's it's often, um, you know, where, where all the answers kind of provide them, you know, present themselves. But yeah, no, I, I love the, you know, I don't understand people who, you know, oh, I can't stand it. I can't, you know, and I'm like, then find something else to do because life's too short. But, you know, I, I then again, you know, I don't know what the hell else I'd be doing if it wasn't for writing and editing and publishing, because like I said, I don't even have a resume. So I, uh, I don't know what I do. I think it's good that I do this because I might otherwise be unemployable. 
that's that's what I've always said. I'm like, you know, I can see myself be a, being a lawyer because I'm very passionate for causes. And, and I, despite my comment about being too lazy to do a tri- true crime book, I do like research. I do like digging yeah. through, you know, words and numbers and piles of things to, to kind of unearth things. But uh, I, I was not a big fan of school. So the idea of going back for law school was just, yeah. So I, I you know, I don't know what I'd be doing. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, I, it's very much, I think, a career that has a lot of highs and lows to it, but, but the highs make it worthwhile. And it's like I say, if you're able to make a living doing what you love doing, right? And I think that's a very privileged, fortunate position to be in. Yeah. And like, and you know, what's interesting is I wasn't able to make a living in those first, you know, decade or whatever editing and, and with the, the Cemetery Dance book imprint, but I loved what I was doing so much. That, that, you know, I always tell people, oh, I financed the business on that that beautiful, like, 23% interest that they they give you those credit cards when you graduate from college. So, and, and they usually send you a lot of them. And so, for me, it was just like, okay, this is going in the business. Um, so, thank God it worked or I would have, you know, hit 30 and had a giant debt at, you know, this crazy interest. But by then, the book in print was kind of, you know, starting to click. But, uh, but yeah, no, I, I just, you know... I, I asked my father once, I said, why were you so supportive? Because he was, he was retired air force. And and like I said, just very old fashioned. And I know he expected me to go out and get a job and do what, you know, the rest of the siblings did. And he always just said, you know what? I knew you were not going to work any harder for someone else than you were working for yourself. So I figured eventually it was going to work. And I was just, I always thought, you know, that was a pretty wonderful thing to hear. Yeah. I mean, and, and certainly for me, it took a little, I mean, all I wanted to do when I was in my teens or early twenties was to write fiction, write novels for the, and I probably done three novels by the time I was 25. Wow. And no one would publish them. And we can all be grateful, I think, <laughs> that happened. But I mean, it wasn't until I was 50, I guess, that I was actually in a position where I was writing books that people were that was selling enough of them that I could do that and nothing else. Right. So it, it took a long time to get there. And but now having, you know, now gotten to that point, which was around 2006. I mean, it's nice that this is a way, you know, like you said, that you can make a living. Now your life saw you were like one on the Canadian list for months. People probably got the other. I got tired of seeing you up there. Well, yeah, we up here in uh, the we have the we have kind of different a few different bestseller lists, but one of them is the Canadian fiction, and it's books by people in Canada. You know, on and I was and the new one, Find You First. I think we did. I think we did eight weeks at number one. It was wow. on the list. It was. It only fell. It finally fell off the list last week. It did thirteen weeks on the, the top ten because of the amazing ending. Well, that's yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not giving anything away other than I'm glad you didn't change the ending. I loved it. Yeah, it was. Uh, that was a fun book to write. There's a lot of good, cool, fun stuff in there. But it was. It was. Uh, it was fun to do. And um, but I was, you know, I was fine too that. You know, every time you do a book, I just like for me, even though like Find Your First was actually the twentieth twentieth novel, and I find still when everyone goes out, I think, yeah, this is the one that's going to tank. Yeah, the, this is the one that's going to just <laughs> and be done. And so, I don't find that I, I haven't reached that point where I just assume it's going to just do well. So you're you know? still nervous on Pub Day, or yeah, kind of a little bit, ang- kind of anxious on Pub Day. Yeah. Um, I find the worst part of all of the, the whole process is that time between you and you send your manuscript into your publisher and then you wait to read what, how your editor likes it. Mm. To me, that's like waiting for tests to come back from the doctor's office. I can see that. Yeah. Am I, am I, is it is it terminal or am I going to be okay? You know, that period is really awful for me. Yeah. Strangely. Uh... Yeah. I mean, well, not strangely with Boogeyman, I definitely felt that I was going to be a smart ass and say, strangely, I didn't feel that way with like Wendy's button box, but I had the big guy kind of pulling the train. So I didn't have to be nervous, but yeah. you know, I probably just jinxed myself saying that now. So, um, but yeah, with Boogeyman, I was a mess waiting to hear what, what she thought. And, and, you know, very early on, one of the questions was, well, if, if, if we get offers on this, but they want to take you out as a character, are you open to that? And I was like, I guess it depends on the offer and you know yes. what the editor says, but uh, yeah, I, I still sit here and, and think, what what did you do putting yourself into a book? And yeah, so anyway, 
Well, I think it's uh, I think it's turned out very well. Thank you. I'm very pleased for it. It's a really great. It's a good book. It's a great book. It's a great. It's just a great concept. You know, like it's it's a very original way to tackle something. It's funny because I just, you know, I, I tell people, I'm like, it, it really is just like a campfire story from, you know, that I told in my youth to scare my friends. And it's just, you know, and it's still me doing the telling and in a, in a slightly more, more mature way, but not not that much. Um, and yeah, I, you know, whenever I hear that, you know, the concept, I always think, you know, and they're all thinking, but, you know, so and so could have done it better. And I'm like, you know what, they probably could have. And that's that's just that side of, of the writer that always has doubt. But um, but yeah, I just I still look at it and I always tell people that now. I'm like, you know, just just consider this kind of a campfire story and pretend you're all sitting around with your friends around a crackling fire and and, and someone's telling you this and, and then you'll kind of get the intent. You know, I've got I've become friends with a guy named Tom Straw during the uh, pandemic, but and we've never met the person we have video chats about every three weeks or so. And, and he's a very successful guy. He's done a lot of stuff. And somebody asked him one day, I thought it's just so perfect. Somebody asked him one day, what's it like? Kind of, you know, filled with awe and wonder, asking, what's it like to be a writer? And he said, it's a constant battle with doubt. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, that's about it. Yeah. That's it up well for me. That, that, that's the, uh, at some point, with this project, it was, uh, and I can't remember who, who I was talking about this with another writer. And I just said, once I got, once I got to the point where I, I kind of believed that it was worthy of being read by other people then, and I was talking about my, myself, writing myself in as a character, because, you know, oftentimes there, when I start a project, that's, that's the feeling in the beginning is, you know, are a lot of people going to want to read this? Is, is this going to appeal? And then I kind of just have to put that away and say, you know what, as long as it appeals to me and as long as I'm happy with it, yeah. then I don't care. And that's kind of how I felt at the end of this one. I, I, I told my wife, I'm like, you know what? I had fun with it and I really like it. So if no one else liked it, that's okay. And I, when Billy was fretting about, you know, dad, you can't do this. You're going to get sued. You're going to drive property values down. I just said, Billy, we don't know whether 50 people are going to read this. It might just be you and mom. I said, or, you know, 50,000, we don't know. And I, I, I'm not going to worry about it. I think it puts the property values up. Everyone's going to want to move there and think, I wonder if this is where he killed anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but a lot of a lot of hometown folks are reading it, and uh, I kind of I kind of trash a nearby town as as you know for their elitism and uh, you know walking around with some noses up in the air. And that's the first thing a buddy of mine who grew up there he messaged me on uh, Instagram the other day, yesterday. He's like, "Hey, that's not fair." I'm like, "You're already on chapter six." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, "Hey, all I did was speak the truth." You know, all those things really happen, but. Yeah, it's been, it's just been interesting writing about the truth, you know, real life, because um, you know, other than journalism, I've never done it. Now, I think I think our host John had said to maybe just check in around eight about oh, yeah. and see if we had any questions coming from anybody. Yeah. So before we get into questions, um, Linwood, you've been so great to to lead the chat with us this evening. Can you tell everybody a little bit about Find You first? Sure. So my latest my latest is as I say is the book this, this year was Find You First which uh, came out hardcover in May. I think it's not in the in North America. I don't think the paperback's out till April, although if we have anybody tuning in from the UK, it's September 3rd is the paperback release. And very quickly, let's uh, uh, find you first about a, a tech guy, loads and loads of money, early 40s, guy named Miles, and uh, never been married, and he's uh, just got more money than God. Um, but he learns that one thing money can't buy is time, and he has a terminal illness he learns, and uh, which also has a high likelihood of being passed on to the next generation. And the doctor says, well, it's a good thing you never had kids. Well, it turns out he was a sperm donor at one time, like two decades ago. And so after some soul searching, Miles thinks, you know, I should try to find these potential, you know, these kids that I may have out there in the world. First of all, let them know that they should get themselves checked. And also, who am I going to leave my, my vast estate to? And as Miles embarks on this quest to find these heirs, they all start vanishing one by one before he can get to them. And that's our, you know, that's my pitch for uh, for finding first. Perfect. It's a great book. And, and I was just saying, as I, as I mentioned when I began, when we started, uh, my coworker Rebecca also loved it as well. So if you guys watching haven't checked it out, definitely do. Uh, so Richard, you mentioned. 
then, you know, there being photos in about the process of that. Did you guys have to take the photos? Were they stock photos? Did you have any input on them? Oh, yeah. I actually took when I submitted the manuscript um, mm -hmm. the first time my agent read it. And then when she submitted it, you know, took it out to market, the photos were all there. You know, we did all the photos ourselves. Um, my son and Billy and I went out and took a lot of them. Um, you know, one of my lifelong friends who's mentioned in the book, uh, he's one of the detectives. I made him go to a go to an, uh, a thrift store and, and find some 1980s uh, sports jackets and um, the the victims in the photographs, uh, the young girls, their daughters of, of friends. Um, my next door neighbor played the girl who got away. And, and I, I mentioned this in the afterward. I, she had to survive because I see her all the time and I couldn't I couldn't stomach if I'd actually killed her. So, uh, and then I had, a, I've done several films with a local production company. Um, and we hired them to, to, to go out and take photos for two different days. And they hire some actors, you know, to play police officers and that kind of thing. So yeah, we had a blast doing the photos. We, uh, you know, we had a lot of fun, you know, kind of developing the mask that the killer wore and, and going to the courthouse and all that. So Susan wants to know, Richard, what was it like writing with Stephen King? Um, all the all the cliches that you can think of, and then some. You know, dream come true. Uh, you know, uh, mind numbing experience. But for me, for a kid who grew up with you know the the Stephen King paperbacks in his back pocket, and the kid who would tell all his friends, "No, wait a minute, you got to hear about this story." You know, the Dead Zone or something. Um, to then you know, actually collaborate on a story. It was just, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a magical experience and it was uh, at times terrifying, but mainly just a lot of fun. And that's a tribute to Steve and the kind of guy he is. He's, you know, he's a really generous, kind guy. And um, yeah, I never, I, you know, it wasn't until I, we did an interview for the audio version of, uh, of uh, Gwenny's button box that I, I never, for some reason, I never stopped and thought, why the heck did you decide to do this with me, Steve? And, I, I was probably afraid, subconsciously afraid to even think about that. But the interviewer for the interview for the bonus material and the audio, she asked the question mm -hmm. and uh, he just, he had just read my collection um, along December and he just said, I thought we would mesh well. I thought Rich could finish the story. Um, so that was neat, you know, and, and, and that's how he treated it. He had that confidence in me. He didn't, you know, kind of hold my hand. We just batted it back and forth and, the third book was more of the same. The third book was much longer and more complex. And um, it was kind of neat to, to, to just trade pages and, and, and leave it open ended and <laughs> go where you want it. Yeah, Very it's cool. great to see that he's such an advocate for for books and especially crime fiction in, in general. We always love seeing him, you know, talk about the, the new thriller. I know like he, he tweeted that he thought that your book was a creep fest. I know that uh, Linwood, he's a, he's a big fan of yours as well. So it's always great to see him kind of tweeting out kind of his new book recommendations. And if I can put in one quick plug, uh, I'll be interviewing Richard's co-writer for the Bloody Scotland Festival on September 18th. Of oh, so cool. So cool. So, so, so is that for that's Bloody Scotland? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So speaking of book recommendations, then you're not allowed to say each other's books. That's my one caveat. What is something that you've read lately that you've loved? Let's start with Linwood. Oh gosh, I just finished something. And I can't, it's funny, you know, I've, I've read so much stuff through the pandemic that I'll read a great book and then I'm on to the next one. And I can't remember what I read last week. And I read, um, first of all, I read Ace Atkins, his latest, The Heathens, which I thought was terrific. He's a wonderful writer. I read a book this summer by a guy named Will Leach called How Lucky, which is a very unusual little book I thought was was very, very good. Um, uh, the Thirsty Murder Club, which is not the kind of book I typically read by Richard Osmond, which you, some might call cozy, um, I thought was terrific fun. It was so funny. Uh, so that's just off the top of my head. But I mean, I, I, I've been just reading so many things that I just you, you sort of forget what did I just finish because uh, I've never gone through so many books like I have in the last year and a half. Yeah. I'm actually scanning through my phone because I'm so brain dead. It's publication week for Boogeyman, so I'm like brain dead, and I'm thinking, oh my god, what did I? I'm, I've been actually on a run where I've I've read you know five or six really good books in a row, mm -hmm. um, and I'm sitting here thinking I can't remember the titles. <laughs> so I know the, the new uh, C.J. Tudor book is wonderful. Um, you know, uh, Billy Summers ain't bad. Billy Summers is awesome. And I actually reread that one 
um, that's the thing. It's nice being friends with Steve. And, and I know Linwood knows this because from time to time you get the, you know, you get the way in advance, you know, hey, you want to read this. Yeah. And I always read it so quickly that by the time the actual book comes out, uh, you know, it's, it's always due for a reread. So Billy Summers was great. I'll tell you, I reread an old book, uh, The House Next Door, and I'm, and I'm cheating because it is on my phone, but the Ann Rivers, uh, I don't know how to say your last name, Sidens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, that it, it's the only, uh, you know, scary book she ever wrote, but it's, it's, uh, it's a little old fashioned, but it's terrifying. And, uh, I reread that recently, but yeah, Riley Sager's new one, CJ Tudor. Yeah. Um, oh, and I got to mention, I can't, it's a, you'll John, you'll know it's, it's, I can't remember her full name cause it's three words and it's long, but the book is called the plot. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. It's, What's the one green? I can't think of it, but anyway, it's great. Thought it was a great book. It's come on, computer. Uh, it's uh, Jen Hant Correlates. Yes. Yeah. That's easy to remember. <laughs> yeah, I it, uh, yeah, but I thought that was just dripping. So, Richard, you mentioned already that you had been a big true crime reader before you started this one. Did you go back and reread anything like from a craft perspective to kind of get an idea for how one of them read before you started this one? I, I went back and I reread and I, and I read several new ones too, mainly to get the, uh, the structure. Um, like I said, you know, there were, there were a, a long time, you know, huge true crime fan. And, and I always recognize the fact that, uh, you know, even though, it, even though they varied structure wise, um, there was still, uh, you know, I'm going to stumble on how to put this. Um, you know, there was still, uh, you know, this universal kind of, uh, uh, you know, I'm just going to forget what I was saying because I'm, I'm not able, I'm able to put the words to it, but I did, I went back and reread probably a half a dozen. And then I also read, you know, three or four new ones. And, and that's why I put like in mine, I put stuff about the town first and then my past. And, and like I mentioned earlier in the interview, you know, I kind of just wanted to, uh, to set up the time and the place and also the, the major players and then get into the crimes. And that's something that I like about some of these true crime books is you kind of, you know, those first two chapters aren't always the most uh, exciting plot wise. But there's a purpose for them. And I think that's what I was trying to stumble to say is that, it, it, you know, there, there was that purpose was always the same in all those true crime books. So that's what I kind of follow that template. Awesome. So I think that is going to about do it for this evening. So just to recap, if any of you guys have tuned in late, we've been chatting with Richard Chismar, whose new book, Chasing the Boogeyman, just came out Tuesday. And we do have signed book plates to go with it. And we've been chatting with Linwood Barkley, whose most recent release, Find You First, came out in May. And we've got copies of both in stock. Um, wanted to mention, obviously, the best way to be able to support the authors and the bookstore is to order copies of the books from us. We um, have dropped links in the chat uh, for that. But also, if you maybe have picked up copies already and you still want to support the bookstore um, and have enjoyed this evening's chat, we do also have a tip chart on PayPal. I'm going to drop a link to that as well. Um, if you miss any part of the chat once we are done, Facebook and YouTube will archive them. We hope that you will um, scroll back through them. We've got some great stuff. You know, Richard mentioned Joe Lansdale. We got to chat with him. Uh, this time last year, we got to actually chat with Stephen King, which was kind of one of the most cool, the coolest things I've ever done as a bookseller. Uh, he got to interview James Lee Burke because he's a big fan. So that's also up on the um, the YouTube channel. And we'll be chatting with James Lee Burke again in uh, just a couple of weeks. So gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us this evening. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks for Richard much. King, congrats on the new book. And as you said, Linwood, hopefully we'll be able to do this back again in the store pretty soon. I hope so. Look you guys take care. That. Thank you guys. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.